I don't think there would be any of us who haven't experienced the Head and Greeter drive-in. And uh, as the uh, the advertising used to say, if you don't like the movie, slash the seats. It was a great campaign that was running for many, many years. But of course, it has been tough for uh, for both our drive-ins and our regional cinemas over the past 18 months. And the federal government have uh, a, have just announced the second round of their $20 million supporting cinemas retention program. And uh, some significant dollars have been given to Scotty for his cinema in Raymond Terrace and also the Head and Greeter drive-in. Joining me on the line now to discuss this and uh, how she's doing, because it is the first time we've spoken to her in 2022. Good morning and welcome, Senator Holly Hughes. Good morning, Tracy. Nice to talk. You too. How are you? Now, before we go any further, how was your Christmas and New Year? It seems like a long, long time ago. It feels like it was a very long time ago, I must say. <laughs> um, but no, it was lovely. I was actually up in Newcastle for Christmas, which was beautiful. So uh, uh, the afternoon was spent swimming at Bar Beach. Couldn't think of a nicer way to spend Christmas Day. I know. I saw some lovely photographs of you, and uh, yes, very nice to see you uh, you up here. Now, look, it has been a really tough time for uh, for all industries, uh, not the least being our cinema industry. We just could not get out and uh, and see cinemas for obvious reasons. But the uh, the federal government has come to the party and is helping keep uh, keep those cinema doors open. Yeah, look, it's really important that we invest across the board in industries. And obviously, the arts sector is, is one of those, uh, and entertainment sectors is one of those areas that was particularly hard hit and had continued to be hard hit when it came to restrictions of uh, how many people that they would be able to allow in at any given moment, so obviously restricting their revenue stream. So the government's committed, as you said, uh, a second round now of $20 million of supporting cinemas, retention, endurance and enhancement of neighbourhoods. So that's a very long way of saying the Screen Fund. Uh, (laughs) But the Screen Fund, it's actually administered by Screen Australia. So Screen Australia has uh, has the, the, the funds from the government to support local cinemas uh, to ensure... I mean, this is this is a, a type of sort of family activity, if you like, that can be quite cost-efficient. You know, it's not something that, that's really an uber-expensive day out or an outing out for a lot of families. Um, so by being able to support these cinemas to make sure that they can continue to operate, it's looking to support all the families in the region and, and everybody else who likes to go to the movies. Mm. I don't get to do it often enough, I must say, but, uh, it, you know, it, it is something that's important for a lot of local communities. And especially because these are small locally owned. These we're not talking about the big multiplexes here. These are small locally owned cinemas. Now, uh, Scotty has been given sixty thousand for Raymond Terrace and thirty five for Head and Greeter. Do we know what uh, what will be done with that? Is it is it for maintenance? Is it for advertising? Is it just to help him get through? What uh, what is the plans with that those dollars? Look, it's really just to ensure that they can get through and that they're restoring their normal operations as restrictions continue to ease, ensure that revenue streams, you know, that, that, that those sort of things are being supported to keep those businesses opening uh, and ensure that they're there for the community as well into the future. And, of course, the applications are, are, are still open mm-hmm. until the 30th of April this year uh, or until all the funds, you know, have expired. But, um, you know, Screen Australia is still administering these. So if there are other cinemas or entertainment uh, programs that want to apply for them, that option's still available. It's been a fun last uh, last few weeks. Now uh, I know you uh, you went back down into Parliament. How's it been? Mm-hmm. Look, it's just before an election, and it's always a little bit spicy. Mm. Say just before an election, so you know certainly uh, there is sort of a. a, a I don't know whether you'd call it a, a boost of adrenaline or a, a little more uh, enthusiasm around the place and uh, excitement. Um, but again, see, we're still quite COVID restricted down there. Um, staff aren't coming down. People aren't coming into the building for meetings. There's certainly no, um, you know, quite often um, organisations, particularly around their um, weeks or, you know, when ovarian cancer or those sorts mm. of things, would normally have held a breakfast. Uh, and this year, again, it was virtual. So it's sort of a bit of a funny place down there at the moment because there's still a lot of restrictions in Parliament House. But, of course, then you can walk out of Parliament House and, and life is almost as normal in Canberra. So it's um, 
it, it kind of feels a little otherworldly. Mm, I bet it does. It has mm. been very spicy, as you said, down there. Um, mm. Lots of testosterone doing the rounds. It's been mm. really tough being uh, being a female politician on on both sides of, of parliament at the moment. You know, we've had uh, we've had the Grace Tame issue. We've had Brittany Higgins. We've had lots of people just throwing grenades wherever they can at uh, at our female politicians. When's mm. enough enough, Holly? Look, I've got to say I hope now. I don't think we're there yet because we're still in a situation where conservative women are fair game, uh, that we're still being referred to by significant commentators and journalists on the left uh, as crumb maidens uh, that we'd still find to abuse conservative politicians just purely for being a liberal. Um, only last week I was referred to as a human shield because obviously I had been sent out to defend one of my male colleagues. Not that I, it could be assumed that I could in any shape or form have formed my own opinion about this, which I find incredibly insulting. Uh, so we're not there yet. I really do hope uh, the hypocrisy of the left soon subsides, uh, purely and simply because there are too many big issues facing this country, facing the world. Um, but even, you know, look at the Hunter. We saw the closure, you know, of another power plant mm-hmm. being announced last week. That's up to 430 jobs that, that are there every day, 230 permanent, 200 contractors, every day that those jobs are going to be lost. But we're also talking about a significant decline here of the ability to provide that power into the grid. And we know as well, in the Hunter region, we've got the Tomago smelter that has had to go offline previously to keep the lights on in Sydney. And it cannot go offline indefinitely. It has a very limited time span that it can go offline for before it becomes redundant and can no longer be turned, excuse me, turned back on. So these are really significant issues. So, um, yes... The attitude towards female politicians, uh, particularly those on the conservative side, is very, very disappointing. Uh, but I really do hope people in some stage, you know, will grow up and realise that there's other issues that we need to deal with that are far more important, uh, but also that, you know, women politicians, quite often a lot of us have our own opinions. Mm pretty strong-minded most of us most of us you know stood up to get ourselves elected and uh and participated in some pretty rigorous pre-selection processes some pretty rigorous rigorous campaigns uh you know referring to us as human shields as crumb maidens doesn't really help anybody it helps absolutely nobody and it doesn't encourage any other woman to get into politics Look, a male journalist said that to me last week he said why would you do it Holly? Mm. like seriously why would anybody want to do it um, and, and that's really sad because 90% of the time it's absolutely fantastic mm. and we get to do great things and, you know, this is this is where the decisions are made and you can influence. Uh, so I would encourage young women to get involved because this is where you can make a difference. Mm. This is where you can stand up and contribute to policy in a very meaningful way. Uh, but it is the, these sorts of behaviours that obviously... You know, women would go. Why would I bother? Yeah, well, especially when you've got uh, you've got the kids to look after, and you know, why why on earth would you do it? And uh, and you know, being a single mum, why would you put your hand up? It's it's just craziness. <laughs> it really quite is. Frankly, you, well, quite frankly, well, quite frankly, you know, a lot of people can earn a lot more in the private sector yeah. without the. Without the scrutiny. Without the grief, without a doubt, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Now, speaking of a roaring, um, obviously that's going to take out at least 25% of the power um, that's mm. generated from New South Wales. There have been calls for uh, for the federal government to come over the top and uh, and really just start to uh, not just invest in, in you know, our, our looking into what we can do with our energy, but really invest in physical things that, that are going to fix this. What is the solution at this point in time? We know we've got three and a half years until a roaring shuts down that's a very quick period of time you know that that's five minutes in in what the plan was Mm. what can we do holly well i mean we have come in over the top and you know you and i talked about it when we announced the curry curry grass you know and so we are investing uh, at the time at least nine labor shadow ministers including pat conroy uh was out there criticizing this project and, you know, how Pat Conroy can stand up and represent the people of Shortland when he's out there advocating for the loss of their jobs, I have absolutely no idea. But he was one of the biggest proponents against the Curry Curry Gas Plant. Now, obviously, some Labor pollings told them that that's not going to work, and they've now come out to now embrace the Curry Curry program, but have also now decided that they want to try and, you know, somehow one-up the government and announce green hydrogen, which is not a cost-effective nor proven technology as yet. So it's just pie in the sky. Uh, so the government has come in with a practical solution, part of the Snowy Hydro program. We are looking at ways that we can continue to invest 
in hydrogen that we know that works, mm. project programs that know uh, that support hydrogen and its creation and delivery and how we are able to transport that. Gas will play a big role in it. Coal will continue to play a very big role in the power that we, is required to keep this country moving. And, uh, you know, the fact that we've now seen Cannon Brooks try and come in over the top with an order, with a, an offer to purchase AGL so they can shut down coal um, is actually a very, very scary place mm. and a very scary place for people in the Hunter region that is so reliant on these jobs. If, you know, if you're looking at your ballot paper in a couple of months and thinking, well, who's going to support not only whether it's my job in coal, but my job that's going to keep the lights on, that my job's still going to exist because so much of the Hunter economy is based in energy production, uh, you know you know where you should be voting because it is not with the Labor Party where they are going to line up with the Greens and shut your jobs down and shut the economy down as quickly as possible. How do we handle, though, Holly? That's all great, and I understand that. But what about the AGLs and the Origin Energies who just decide, well, I'm sorry, we're getting out of this industry. What do we do if another one comes along? You know, if Bayswater comes along and says, well, if they can shut in three and a half years, we're going to do the same thing. What happens if we do lose all of these uh, these power plants, not through through government, but through private enterprise? Well, I think some of these decisions aren't based necessarily on commercial grounds. They're based on some sort of trying to be woke in the industry. Um, I would suggest if you've got a power station up in the Hunter region now, you're in a pretty good position when it comes to your commercial viability uh, and only boosted by this closure announcement. So, you know... Companies will look at these. They're, they're, they're private companies. We're not, mm. you know, and, and ASX listed companies. We're not going to be in, in the business of, uh, you know, trying to run their balance sheets and run their companies. I don't think any company would want us to do that. Uh, but certainly, there's market-based decisions. And uh, if your power is going to be starting to go for a premium, and these other guys go woke, go broke, mm. and get out of the business. I, you know, I would imagine these commercially, they would become increasingly commercially viable at a better business mm. decision. It's going to be a very interesting next uh, 18 months to uh, to three oh. to five years with, without oh. uh, without a doubt. Look, thank you so much for your time. Um, obviously, uh, we are going to find out about an election sooner or later. It is yep. uh, it is getting closer and closer. And as you said, the testosterone is rolling on both sides. So it's going to be fun for the next uh, couple of months. Keep them honest down there, won't you? Oh, do my best, Tracy. Do my best. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate your time. <laughs> You're listening to Newcastle in the Morning.